Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. You may sit, please. Let me take this opportunity to extend a very special welcome. I know you have been welcome already, but I certainly would want to extend a special welcome to you, uh, Member of Parliament for St. George North, uh, Tony Moore. A pleasure having you with us. And by extension, your executive, um, a pleasure having you with us today. And those who are viewing live stream, we want to thank you for sharing this experience. I want to really commend MP Tony Moore for choosing to fellowship with us today. We really deem that an honor and a humbling experience. I am seeing a familiar face <laughs> and I believe I have it right, Paul Bentham. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Good having you here with us today. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14 from the New Living Translation says to us, Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. And then verse 15 from the same New Living Translation says to us, See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. As a national church, we have as a theme, Stronger Together. And that theme that we have chosen, our chairman, the Reverend Vasco Perry, would have chosen to guide us throughout the year, has legs. Your being here today is helping us to live out this theme. The church cannot or should not be brushed aside, but should be seen as a vital link when decisions are being made. The church should be seen as a partner. And MP, I want you to understand that this is a partnership. Um, I am tempted to say that this is now the engagement and just now we'll have the wedding ceremony. But, but a, a partnership because I understand that if we are going to be effective that we need each other. We cannot distance ourselves, but we have to recognize that we are in partnership. So, there are some things that Paul would have said to the church at Thessalonica. And may I say to us that the church at Thessalonica was a pretty young church. And the Apostle Paul had to run from there. He did not spend the kind of time that he intended to, but he had to run because of persecution. So it was a young church, and obviously it would have meant that the, the personnel that he had there, he had to encourage them, etc. Permit me today to lift Portions, the portions are found 
in that text, permit me to lift it today out of its context and seek to suggest some things to us. The first thing that Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, and I believe he is saying to us today, is we are to admonish the unruly. Another version adds to it by saying, we are to admonish the unruly and disruptive. From the New Living, it says to us that we have to address the lazy. Now, when we think of our country and all that is happening around us, it seems to be a sense of lawlessness that is evident in our society. And the word of God says to us that we are to admonish. And this is where we need to understand that yes, the government will play their part, but we as a church, we have to play our part as well. Once upon a time, you know that's like a story, once upon a time, children were active when it came to Sunday school and attending Sunday school. One might argue that because of COVID and so on, that a number of things would have taken place in the context of society. But I want to suggest to us that Sunday school is still relevant because it gives children grounding. So watch this. Once upon a time, the seniors would say to us, that they could have leave home and go to Bridgetown. Leave their windows and their doors open. And should the rain start to fall, a neighbor would go over and close up. Well, even when you close up today, persons are still gaining entry. Persons, they have all types of systems connected to phone and the whole nine yards and persons are still gaining entry. I want to submit to us today in no uncertain terms that we need to as a church, as a community, as a country to admonish those who are unruly. And let me say because I know sometimes you are gripped with fear. Because the moment you attempt to speak to some person when they're doing something that you know is not right, they would let you know from generations back to generations present. But you know what? We are going to do it anyway. So we are to admonish them. And I'm saying that the partnership that is necessary to ensure that we have the kind of society that persons would want to not only live, but work and enjoy. That is the kind of country that we want to have. And we are going to do it together. We are going to do it together. Not only are we to admonish the unruly, or the disruptive. And I'm not saying to ball them out or anything. But you speak to them nicely. But we are to encourage the faint hearted. You see. Persons are now fearful. Now basically that's faint hearted. You're fearful. You, you're wondering what is going to happen next. And I'm saying to us, as we partner, we need to understand that we have to encourage the faint-hearted. Because the reality is, every single person is dealing with the crisis situation differently. So you have 
economic crisis. You have mental health crisis. And the list goes on. And I'm saying to us today that it provides us with an opportunity that when those persons are down, when those persons are discouraged, when those persons feel as though that they cannot go another leg of the race, we are saying to them, come on, you can make it. Come on, we are going to run this race together. We are going to encourage the faith hearted. My friends, the church and the state, contrary to some thinking, must be able to work together. So we are to encourage the faint-hearted. And as Paul addresses the saints at Thessalonica, and as I said, I'm lifting it out of its context to somehow help us to lay hold of some things, he goes on to say, I don't want, only want you to admonish the unruly. I don't only want you to encourage the faint-hearted, but I want you to help the weak. I want that to sink in. Because we have to realize that because we have achieved some level of success, we should never ever forget what the Bajans would say where we come from. We should never ever forget that and we should position ourselves to help those who are less fortunate. L listen to me carefully. Listen to me carefully. Our country, our society, I am tempted to say maybe our world is plagued with persons that are not as fortunate as some of us are. And the onus is on us as a people to assist them. I know that sometimes it is said that the church is not doing anything. But let me say to you that the church is doing so much. The problem is, or not the problem, but the challenge is, or not the challenge, but the way how we do it. We don't run around and say, this is what we are doing. We quietly do what we have to do because we know that it is the responsibility of the church. And may I say to you today that we are not only going to do it alone, but we are going to partner. I love that. We are going to partner. We are going to work together because we want those who are less fortunate to be able to enjoy life as well. You see... When you look around, some persons, they have found themselves in situations, not by choice, but by circumstance. And whether it's by choice or by circumstance, we are to do what we are supposed to do. help them. Then Paul hits it so nicely. He says, be patient with everyone. And when I gave thought to that, I said, you know what? We are on different rungs of the ladder. So because I am on the bottom rung, that does not give you the right to be impatient with me. 
help me to get to another Rome. So Paul simply says to the church at Thessalonica, and I believe the word of God is seen to us today, as we put it in a context that would fit our situation, we are to be patient with each other. Have you ever gotten impatient with someone yet? Because you figure, my, listen to me. I, I, I suppose the easiest one probably is maybe driving. So I, 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 I watch what I watch. Huh? You are parking a small car. So, so a, a, a small car. Let me leave it as that. You go forward, you come back. You go forward, you come back. You swing left, you, lift, you swing right. You're still trying to park. You can't get that park though. <laughs> you buy that license. And, and, and depending on, on your time frame, you can start to blow the horn. All, all you got to say is, Man, I can be patient with you. I, I ain't sure what happened. Um, it could be a situation where um, it, it's not just one of those days, you know. <laughs> so so, so the, the point that I want to make is that we have to be patient with each other. And then Paul somehow seeks to wrap it up. Paul wraps it up nicely. He said, some Strong words. And I, I, I was trying to figure out, well, how can you say these words to persons? Paul said, I want you to rejoice always. Now, now to be able to rejoice always is based on relationship, you know. It is based on the relationship that you have with the master. It is based on relationship that you have with your colleagues. It is based on relationship that you have with your friends. So Paul says, I want you to rejoice always. Now let me tell you that that is not the easiest of things to do. How can you rejoice when you don't have food to eat? How can you rejoice when your whole world seems to be caving in? It's based on relationship. When you have that relationship with the master, and if other persons have that relationship with the master, the God that we serve would say to you when he speaks to you in that still small voice, I want you to visit Mary Brown. Mary Brown is in a situation and I can say to you that when you visit Mary Brown and you impact Mary Brown's life, Mary Brown is going to be able to rejoice. So the scripture says to us that we are to rejoice always. It goes on to say to us, my friends, that we are to pray without ceasing. No. let me go back to the same car business, you know. Because some persons might figure that when the scripture says to pray without ceasing, that what we are supposed to do is close our eyes, go on our knees, and start to pray. So back to the same car business, you decide that you are going to be praying without ceasing. You close your eyes and go on your knees and two things are going to happen. The record going to come and a funeral director will also turn up. When the apostle Paul says to the church at Thessalonica and is saying to us to pray without ceasing, I want to suggest to us today that it does not necessarily mean that we have to close our eyes or anything of the sort every time, but that we can communicate with our God at every point. In the kitchen, you can talk to him. 
Ma'am, when you are in parliament and there are difficult decisions, you don't have to say, look, permit me to pray, but you can commune with your God and the God that we serve will give you wisdom to be able to say the right things. We have confidence in you and the God that you serve. Pray without ceasing. And then Paul wraps it up by saying, in every circumstance, give thanks. Give thanks. Listen, there is so much that we as a people can give God thanks for. There was a time when we had what used to be called pig toilets. We still have some in the minority. We still have some. And that's why we have to help. But let me say to you that we have no indoor. So you can go and you can have your shower without going on the outside. And I'm saying to us today that we have to help those. And that's why the partnership is necessary in every situation, in every circumstance, we are to give thanks. And that is what would have brought you folk here today to simply say, God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you for the ability to serve. Thank you. And the Old Testament text that we had where Jeremiah who is known as the weeping prophet would have simply said it is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Great is thy faithfulness. I want to say to us today as we continue to work through these trying times as we continue to ensure that we create the kind of society that would be pleasing to almighty God and to others recognize that we are in this together. There are some things that we might not be able to do but there are things that we are able to do and when we do it together you'll be amazed at the success and it's just designed that God would get the glory and together we'll be, in, we'll be able to enjoy a quality life. As we stand together today,